Today I want to speak to you on the subject of seven things God wants to do for you. I know sometimes when you talk about God blessing and God's favor, uh, some people rejoice in that and other people are very critical of that. I heard someone <clears throat> say not too long ago that we live to serve God, that God does not live to serve us. And they were presenting that from the view that God is the one that receives from us through our life, through our service, through our love, through our worship. And that is true, but they also inferred that it was wrong or that it was spurious to believe that perhaps God would want to do anything to serve us. But the Bible clearly presents God as a loving Heavenly Father. And He is high and He is holy and all have fallen short of His glory. I am not in any way teaching that men are co-equals with God. There is a a doctrine that is taught that we are little gods that is uh, heretical and uh, we are not little gods. We are the creation of God. He alone is God. The Lord our God is one God. But I would also present to you, as I will today, through the teaching of God's holy word, that God is loving, and God is kind, and God is merciful, and God is generous. And I want to take you into the 91st Psalm, and it's not a long psalm. I'd like to read it together. And as we do, let's discover seven things that God wants to do for every child of God. Psalm 91, the Bible says, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust Him. For He will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and your protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, Though 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust me. In my name, when they call on me, I will answer, and I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Let's pray together. Father, once again, we give you praise and honor and glory for you are our Heavenly Father. And through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth and lived and died upon the cross and shed his blood as the sinless, innocent Lamb of God, thereby paying for the penalty of all of our sin. And by the shedding of the blood, the curse of sin has been broken and the covenant of God is made available. Thank you for your precious promise that declares all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
And my prayer today is for all that might be listening to the Bible being taught, that they might hear more than words, that they might hear more than lecture. I pray that they might hear the voice of God and the presence of God and the love of God calling them. My prayer is that every single person and every member of their family would be ready for the soon coming of the Lord. And while we await the promises of God, I pray that you would help us to better understand your precious promises and not only to understand them, but to take them into our hearts and to live them each and every day and to speak of them with the words of our mouth. And so now let the words of our mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight by the anointing of the Spirit. Lead us and guide us for all things. We'll be very careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, I read the 91st Psalm to you in its totality out of the New Living Translation. You might be reading out of another translation and the uh, verbiage might be just slightly different, but I will be explaining some of these wonderful things to you today as we look into the scripture and discover seven things in this psalm that God has stated that it's his will, that he desires and wants for your life. It's amazing that I will, or if you're reading the King James or perhaps the New King James Version, uh, your translation may read, I shall. But whether your translation reads, I will or I shall, in this one psalm of a handful of verses, it is found no fewer than 17 times. Now the reason that I want to point that out to you is I shall or I will is the strongest assertion that could be made in the English translation of your Bible to convey what God desires to do. Uh, an example of that in the New Testament would be John chapter 14 and verse 14. There the Bible says, If you will ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. Uh, let's go to that verse, because if you don't have that highlighted in your Bible, uh, that's one of those precious, precious verses that you should take with you into your times of prayer and pray based upon that promise of God. John chapter 14 and verse 14, the Bible says, Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Another translation reads, you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it, so that the Son might bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask for anything in my name and I will do it. As you read through your Bible, it probably would be a Wonderful idea to highlight and to make note of the fact every time throughout the scripture you hear God say, I will or I shall. It literally means, John chapter 14 and verse 14, if you will ask anything in my name, if you don't have it, I will create it. Think of that. If you will ask anything in my name, if you don't have it, I will create it. Now we understand from the epistle of James that proper prayer and powerful prayer is based upon praying in the will of God. In other words, this I will do it is not a license for you to just start claiming anything in life that you want without understanding the mind of God and the word of God and the will of God. But let's take a closer look at Psalm 91 with this in our understanding. And let me share with you seven things that God wants to do for you today. Number one, if you're taking notes, God wants to protect you 
and to rescue you. Let's take a look at that. Go down to verse 3. The Bible says, For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease or noisome pestilence. I believe the King James Version renders that. For he, God, will rescue that word rescue from the original means to deliver you without fail. God wants to rescue you, to deliver you without fail from every trap. Now let me pause right there. God not only wants to rescue you and protect you from the traps and snares of life, but it also from the original means He'll rescue you not only from the trap, but he'll rescue from the people who set the trap for you. Whether it be sin or Satan or an individual in your life who opposes you in all of your going in and all of your going out. God's desire is to protect you and to rescue you from every trap and not just the trap, but the individual who set the trap for you. And then it says, and will protect you from deadly disease. I thank God that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he not only died for the forgiveness of our sins, but he died for the healing of our bodies. Sadly, healing is one of those subjects that is misunderstood, oftentimes taught in an erroneous way. But even in the Old Testament, we see the power of God healing. I want to make a statement, and I don't want you to miss it. I want to give you a solid gold nugget that I hope you'll always cherish and may God by the Holy Spirit brand it in your heart. Listen carefully. Just as every sinner has the privilege to call upon the Lord for salvation, Every child of God has the privilege to call upon the name of the Lord for healing. He is not only our Father, He is our great physician. We serve a God of signs and wonders and miracles. And the testimonies that I have seen throughout my 42 years of ministry, too many to list, but I have seen God do miracles. I have seen God take people who were paralyzed and raise them up out of wheelchairs. And I'm not talking about somebody that had a sprained ankle. In one of our meetings a few years ago in Massachusetts, in a place called Fitchburg, Pastor Brian Tomes, the pastor then, the pastor now, could verify what I'm saying. A man who had been paralyzed in a wheelchair for an excess of 20 years, and I forget exactly what vertebrae it was, but had no ability from the waist down to move a single muscle, couldn't move his legs, couldn't move his feet. But in the meeting while I was preaching, I wasn't even praying for the sick. I was preaching the word of God. It reminds me of the verse that says, He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. May it be so today for those that are listening. Many times the emails and the social media responses that come to me oftentimes list a prayer request for a physical infirmity, for a sickness, or for a disease. I read some yesterday that came in. Parents praying for children that were sick. But I'm here to tell you that the God of heaven and earth wants to deliver you and protect you from sickness, disease, and infirmity. And when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he is the God who can rescue you even from that dark valley of despair. In the mighty name of Jesus, I release the healing power of God to every listener today who needs healing in their body. 
I release the fire of God that drives out disease and infection. And I pray that you would touch and heal your people and raise them up even as I speak for the glory of God in Jesus' name. That man later told me in Massachusetts, as you were preaching, he said, the thought went through my mind, my feet are cold. And I no sooner thought my feet are cold, and I thought, my feet are cold. I haven't had feeling in my feet for over 20 years. And then he said, I began to notice sensations that had begun in my feet and began to work up through my legs. And on his own, stood up out of a wheelchair after being paralyzed for 20 years and healed and not healed for five minutes. The last I heard, he is still healed and still walking. I saw the same in a crusade in the Middle East, a man brought to me who had been crippled for 12 years, instantaneously healed in front of that crusade audience of in excess of 50 to 70 thousand people, eyewitnesses to the miracle power of God. I could brag on God for a long, long time, but I want to encourage you today and remind you that in this day where fear and sickness and disease and plague and pandemic has been shoved into the very spotlight of the consciousness of all who live on the face of this earth, I choose to declare that my God heals every sickness, every disease, every infirmity. And if you're a child of God, you have a privilege to call upon the name of the Lord each and every time you face a disease in your body. The scripture tells us that God wants to protect us from snares and from traps. There are many temptations and snares and traps in life, and they're not always the result of our enemies. Sometimes they're results that are connected to bad decisions. Sometimes the snares that we face in life are directly related to our not being obedient to the word of God, nor to his covenant. But God is merciful. And today I want you to know that God wants to protect you and to rescue you. Let me give to you a personal prayer, a prayer that I pray many times, not every day, but I've prayed this prayer, no doubt, thousands of times. When I've gone before God in prayer, I've asked God through this prayer, I've said this, Lord, protect me. And when I'm not smart enough to protect myself, protect me anyway. Because I want to walk humbly before the Lord. I know that I have limitations in my ability to see and to perceive and to even guard and to protect my own life and my own ministry and my own reputation. But I pray on a regular basis, oh God, protect me. And when I'm not smart enough to protect myself, by your mercy and by your grace, protect me. Uh, look at verse 4. There in Psalm 91 and verse 4, the Bible says, He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Through the years, I've heard a lot of erroneous teaching on this verse. God does not have angels' wings. God is not in any way related to any bird species. He does not have literal feathers. That's not what this passage is talking about or inferring. It literally speaks of a parent bird that protects its young by covering it under its wings and under its feathers when perhaps the weather is harsh or even when predators are flying by. Uh, a mother bird will oftentimes take her little babies and gather them in with her feathers and pull them in close to herself and cover them out of sight and out of harsh weather, out of predators' eyes, and protects them in her own presence. There is a protection, don't miss this, 
There is a protection afforded to us when we are in the presence of God. And the closer you are to God, the greater the level of the protection. Let me say it again. The closer we draw nigh to God and to his powerful presence, the greater is the security of that protection. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 11, the Bible says, Like an eagle that rouses her chicks and hovers over her young, so he spread his wings to take them up and carried them safely on his pinions. The Bible tells us that God's faithful word is our armor and our protection. The meaning is that God's pledges and God's promises contained in this Bible is the same thing as a warrior in battle that holds a shield. When you live in the Bible, when you obey the Bible, when you speak the Bible, you are literally holding a spiritual shield between yourself and the forces of sin and sickness and the attacks and the temptations of the world that may come your way. God's promises, in other words, provide a de defensive, bulletproof armor that surrounds us. Uh, think of the uh, old uh, wars where soldiers wore coats of mail made out of metal to fit them and to protect them from swords and spears and arrows. God's promises are a spiritual coat of mail. Number two, God wants to place a holy hedge of divine protection around your home. Praise God. God wants to place a holy hedge of divine protection around your home and your property. Look at verses 9 and 10. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you and no plague will come near your home. No plague will come near your home. In the power and in the presence of God, there is an available holy hedge of protection that surrounds your property and your home. The scripture tells us that God never sleeps, nor does he slumber. So even when you're resting at night and the lights are out, and you are peacefully in the presence of God and resting, there is still a holy fence of divine protection that surrounds your home from all of the wicked, all of Satan's schemes. I believe in Jesus' name that there is a holy hedge of protection, as the scripture says. But notice that it says, if you make God your refuge... Is God your refuge? Is God your heavenly father? Are you living in right relationship with God? Have you repented of sin? Someone wrote me the other day as I was speaking in one of the teachings on holiness and how important it is to live a holy life and to walk uprightly and to obey the teachings of the Lord. And they said, well, my pastor taught us that all of our sins, past, present, and future, are already forgiven. Well, let me tell you something. That is not truth. The only sin that God can forgive is a sin that has been confessed and repented of. And just because you're a Christian does not mean that sin has no more temptation or power in your life. As long as you live in a body of flesh, you must constantly discipline and keep under arrest the carnal nature that abides in our flesh. In other words, you can crucify your flesh today, but it'll make a fresh resurrection tomorrow. Even the Bible tells us in the New Testament, the Bible says in John's 
uh, writing, if we confess our sins, he was writing to believers. He wasn't writing to unsaved people. He wasn't writing to sinners. He said as Christians, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in 1 John, when the author John wrote that, he was letting us know that Christians aren't perfect. And if you're a brand new Christian, maybe this will help you because sometimes new Christians put people up on pedestals that should not be placed there. Even Christians have imperfections. Even Christians have faults. Even Christians make bad decisions. Even Christians fail and stumble. Even Christians sin. But no Christian lives a willing life of sin. And there is the difference. But when we have sinned, the Bible says we must confess it and we must repent of it. The word repent means make a U-turn. It means go in the opposite direction. You can't have a sinful habit and just decide I'm going to accept this as a personal weakness. I was born this way or I inherited this from my family DNA or alcoholism runs in my family or drug addiction runs in my family or crime runs in my family and you begin to accept sin in your life and think, well, I prayed a sinner's prayer one time, therefore all of my sin, past, present, and for future are already forgiven. Not so. We've been called to live a holy life. But the scripture tells us that as we make God our refuge and we begin to read, to study, to learn his covenant and abide in it, he said one of the blessings that comes with that, God said, I will surround your house with supernatural protection. The Bible tells us, look at verse 9 and verse 10 one more time. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. Even when the enemy intends for your harm, God wills for your good. Number three, God wants to provide angelic protection for you. Angels are real. And uh, for those of you who have more curiosity about angels on our podcast channel and on our video archives and on our YouTube channel, I have an entire in-depth study on angels and I would encourage you to read it and to listen to it and to take your Bible and to study it. The word angel uh, from the Greek, now we're in the Old Testament, which is Hebrew, but from the Greek, because I'm going to show you some scriptures in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, but that word is angelos, which means messenger. Uh, there are different types of angels. The Bible speaks of seraphims and cherubims and principalities and archangels and guardian angels. And as I've already mentioned, we have an in-depth study on angels I hope that you'll listen to it. But go into the Bible, into Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. And go down to verse 14. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14. The Bible says, Therefore, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people, who will inherit salvation. Now once again, I must point out with an exclamation point that these desires of God for you are connected to having right relationship with Him. And if you've never repented of sin or asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior at the end of this time of teaching, uh, as always, when I speak, there will be an opportunity for you to turn from sin and turn to Christ. And I'd like to lead you in prayer and have the privilege of praying with you. 
These are benefits that are associated with having right relationship with God. And once you have peace with God and right relationship with God, and you can call Him your Heavenly Father, these are seven things that He said He'll do for you. And one of them speaks of He wants to provide the presence of angelic protection. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 in the King James Version, I believe, states it this way. Are they not all ministering spirits, speaking of angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent for those who are the heirs of salvation? Because you have received salvation through the cross of Christ, you now have access to angels that follow you in life. And the Bible says that they're your servants. Many times when I pray, I access Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14. And I'll ask the Lord, I'll say, Father, you said in the scriptures that angels are ministering spirits that are sent forth for those who are the heirs of salvation. And so I ask you today, send a mighty, powerful angel of the Lord into this circumstance. And it may be somebody that I'm praying for, somebody that's not with me, but a prayer request has come in and they're far away. We have the ability to ask God to assign angels and to put them on divine assignments for us and for others. As long as we're in Hebrews, go over to the 13th chapter. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2. The Bible says, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. If you're a child of God there is a good chance that at some time in your life there has been an angel involved but you didn't recognize them. Because the Bible said that angels sometimes work on behalf of our needs without drawing attention to themselves. They don't always appear as large angels and glowing white robes and wings and whatever you may have for your uh, imagination as to what an angel may look like. I remember a time in my life when Judy and I were just getting started and uh, many of you have heard me say that Judy and I didn't even have a home for the first four years of our ministry. We literally lived out of a car and, and lived on the road as we were trying to get started in the calling of God upon our lives. And uh, back in those days, uh, things sometimes were a little tight. Uh, My first year in full-time evangelism, married and traveling with a vehicle that my dad had showed up at Bible college and handed me not only the keys to a new vehicle, but handed me the payment book and put me in debt without consent and said, your first payment's due, and I think it was about 20-some days. And in that first year of traveling full-time in ministry, we made just over $3,300 for the year, our total annual income. How we were able to live on that, I have no idea other than the favor and the help of God. And we never missed paying our tithes, and we never missed sowing an offering on top of that. But God began to help us. But even in those early days, there were times when we had to trust God. I remember our first apartment and trusting God for rent some months and trusting God for money to buy food. Uh, There was one time that I was on the road and Judy was home with our two children. They were small, Jonathan and Jessica, just little. And uh, she needed grocery money and prayed and uh, asked the Lord. That was back in the days when there weren't uh, cell phones or at least uh, for the average person there were not cell phones And Judy had no way of connecting with me or calling me. And uh, I was traveling. And uh, many times she wouldn't tell me. She knew that God was our source. And just as I was trusting God, sometimes Judy had to trust God. 
And she prayed and asked the Lord for provision. And it was in winter and snowing. And someone knocked at the door. And she was upstairs and came down and opened the door. And I believe if my memory serves me right, it was a a lady standing there. And she handed my wife an envelope that Judy thought was just a misplaced misplaced piece of mail. And uh, Judy said, thank you, and closed the door. And when she opened it, there was $300 cash inside that envelope. And Judy opened the door, and no one was there. And there was no car. And the only thing that we could say to that experience in life is perhaps we entertained an angel, or she did that day. God has angels who work on our behalf, and God wants to provide you as a child of God with angelic protection. I would encourage you to look up and to mark Hebrews 1.14 and Hebrews 13.2 and keep those in heart and mind and spirit and memory. God has angelic protection for you. Number four, God wants to answer your prayers. I've heard some people pray, and by the manner of their praying, I was convinced that they felt like they had to twist God's arm or beg or plead or make a case, change God's mind or whatever their situation was. They just perhaps did not understand that according to the scripture that God wants to answer your prayers. The Bible tells us, look at verse 15 in Psalm 91, when they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. The most underestimated power and privilege utilized by the average child of God, if you were to ask me, my answer would be prayer. People don't pray as they should. The Bible tells us that we should pray about everything. The Bible tells us, Jesus said, pray without ceasing. The Bible tells us, in all your ways, acknowledge me and I will direct your path. As a child of God, with God as your heavenly father, knowing that he wants to answer your prayers, you should be motivated to pray. Talk to God about everything. If it's of importance to you, it's of importance to God. God has always been a God who answers prayer. In Psalm 145 and verse 18, the Bible said, The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. One translation speaks of humility. And I want you to connect this in your mind and write it down and make note of it. It's of great, great importance in the walking out the power and the promise of prayer. And that is promises follow humility. The promises of God follow your decision to walk humbly in the eyes of the Lord. God hates pride and God detests arrogance. And God is not your drive through window where you drive up and shout out what you want with arrogance, with no respect, and go to the second window and put your hand out and say, now God, give it to me. That's not what the Bible is inferring. The Bible tells us that his promises follow our humility. And when you follow God, many times you'll not have to ask for much. Let me say that again. When you are in proper relationship with God, living according to his word and his covenant, you'll not have to ask for much. Because if you're walking in righteousness and humility before God, he'll go before you and provide for you. Think of the story in the New Testament of the prodigal son. When he left his father's farm, what did he say to the father in Luke's gospel? He said, Father, give me what belongs to me. 
Now he had a legal right, he was of age, to claim a portion of his inheritance. He was legally right, but he was morally wrong. He demanded of his father, give me, I'm old, maybe he was 18. I'm 18 now, I'm 21 now, give me what belongs to me. And the father did. But the Bible tells us that his attitude followed him all the way to his new location. And there his life descended because of his attitude, because of his irresponsibility, because of his sin, because of his wild lifestyle, because of the type of people he was hanging out with, because of the parties he was attending. And it didn't take long that he found himself in a meager job and he had to actually eat the same slop that he was feeding to the pigs he was tending. But one day he came to himself and said, you know, even those who work for my father live better than I do. I'm going to humble my heart and I'm going to go home to my father and I'm going to tell him I'm sorry and maybe he'll let me just be a servant. And when he went home to the father, he said in Luke's gospel, Father, make me as one of thy servants. But the Bible says that the father was rejoicing that his lost son had came home and he put upon him the family ring and put upon him fine clothes and threw an incredible banquet for him and put him back in his rightful place of sonship. He didn't require him to be a servant. He restored him into the full benefit of the family inheritance and blessings because his father, like our heavenly father, is gracious and quick to forgive and merciful when we walk before him in humility. What did, very important, what did the son say when he left home? Father, give me. When he said, Father, give me, he soon lost everything. What did he say when he returned home? He said, Father, make me. And when he said, Father, make me, he received all of the blessings available from the hand of the Father. Write this down, another piece of biblical solid gold. When you pray, Father, make me, you'll rarely have to pray, Father, give me. Let me say it again. If you walk before God with an attitude of, Father, make me what I ought to be. Make me your son or your daughter in right standing. Make me in your image and in your will. Those who pray, Father, make me, will rarely have to pray, Father, give me. Those of you who follow this ministry, I'm going to be honest with you. Rarely do I ever pray, for money for this ministry. And the ministry is large and the ministry has many needs. Our weekly budget is far greater than our first annual budget. And there are days that our daily budget is greater than our first annual budget. But you never hear me beg, you never hear me cry, you never hear me complain, you've never heard me say, if we don't hear from you by the end of the month, we may not be here and we'll have to shut these cameras down and shut the recording down and wouldn't it be sad? And no, I'm not a beggar. And I'm not highlighting myself and I certainly am not intending to pat myself on the back. But I think I can say with clean hands in the presence of a holy God, I rarely pray about money and supply and provision for this ministry. Because I learned a long time ago that if I'll do what God asked me to do, and if I'll minister to people, and if I'll open the word of God and teach it without fear of culture or approval, you know, Sometimes what I teach hurts you, it stings, it's convicting, and God does the same with me when I open up the Bible and study. But I promise I won't lie to you. I'm not one of those preachers that'll open the Bible and try to set you up and promise you that today's your day of breakthrough, and I don't know if today's your day of breakthrough, I don't know how you're living. 
I can't make a blanket statement that everybody that's listening to me today, today's your day of breakthrough. It may be your day of judgment. I don't know how you're living. I can't stand and preach and proclaim the Lord spoke to my heart that everyone that comes out on Tuesday night, God's going to promote you in your job. I can't promise you promotion. I'm not the author of your promotion. I don't know if you're a giver. I don't know if you're a tither. I don't know if you sow. I don't know if you cheat or if you're dishonest. I can't make some vague general promise and blanket statement that God's going to bless everybody on a Tuesday night that comes to my meetings. And anybody that does that is a fool. And all who listen to them are greater fools. I'll always tell you the truth, even if it stings. Because sometimes for God to bless us and to promote us, there are sins that have to be repented of. You can't be lazy and expect God to bless you. The Bible says a man that doesn't work shouldn't eat. I don't feel a great deal of sympathy to feed people who are begging, who have the ability to work. I've been in foreign countries preaching the gospel. I'll never forget it. In Thailand, one of my early crusades, 1981, I watched a man that only had one leg, born that way it looked like, just one leg that came out of his lower body and crippled. Even the leg that he had was not functional. His arms were strong and he had a stick and he would stab that stick into the ground and pull himself along the ground. And the whole side of his body that drug along the ground was calloused, probably an inch or two thick. And the pastor told me that I was with, that man's going to work. I'll never forget that as long as I live. That man provides for his family and they know him here in this small village and he's going to work. Born with one leg, the one leg that he was born with didn't function. Dragging himself along the, the earth like a, like a rodent or a snake. His whole side of his body calloused thick from a lifetime of dragging himself wherever he had to go. And yet some people illegally take workman's compensation and, and uh, I better behave myself. But I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. A man that doesn't work shouldn't eat. The blessings of God are not for the lazy. The blessings of God are not for the crooked. The blessings of God are not for those who abuse the system. Thank you for all those amens. Psalm 148 Psalm 145, verse 18, The Lord is close to all who call on Him. Yes, all who call on Him in truth. Number five, we're teaching out of Psalm 91 today, seven things that God wants to do for you. Number five, God wants to stand by you when you're in trouble. People get in trouble. People make bad choices. People do things that they later regret, but unfortunately, life doesn't have a rewind button. Many times you suffer the consequences of decisions that you made outside of prayer, outside of the Bible, and outside of the will of God. But even when you're in trouble, your heavenly Father wants to stand by you. God is to be acknowledged by prayer, and if we acknowledge God by prayer, it'll save us a lot of trouble, but... Not everybody does that. And sometimes I've seen Christians that have got themselves in trouble. The Lord promises to be with us even in times of adversity, not just in our times of victory. Psalm 34 and 19, the Bible said, The righteous face many troubles, but the Lord rescues them from each and every one. We could talk to you about Joshua. We could talk to you about David and Goliath. We could talk to you about the three Hebrew children. We could talk to you about Daniel. We could walk through the Bible and show you multitudes of stories of people who were in trouble. 
but the Lord rescued them. It's always God's desire to help you even when you're in trouble. Uh, go to Psalm 107. Psalm 107 and verse 19 and 20. The Bible said, Lord, help. There's a two-word prayer that the Lord hears. Lord, help. They cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, snatching them from the door of death. Number six, God wants to honor you. When the Bible speaks in the Psalms about God honoring you, and even in other passages in the Scripture, honor in the Bible speaks of promotion, it speaks of of abundance, and it speaks of substance. And God wants to honor those who live for him. Many of you have been raised in a mindset of lack or, or poverty or never excelling. But God wants to honor you. God wants to promote you. And some of you, God has helped you. God has blessed you. God has promoted you. But you're still holding on to that mindset of lack and poverty because you were raised that way and it got into your mind and it got into your DNA and it got into your spirit. But God wants to deliver you from that today. Some of you have the ability when you go out to eat to order anything you want on the menu. Going out to eat is not something that's unattainable to you. You can go out to eat if you so desire. But to prove to you that you still hold on to a spirit of poverty and lack, when you open the menu, you still order by the price instead of by the portion. You see something on that menu that if there were no prices at all, or if everything on the menu cost the exact same, you'd have no problem making a decision. You know what? Ribeye is my favorite steak. I think I'll have the ribeye. But then you go across and it says $28. You think, oh, wow. But you can afford $28. Now, there might be people that are listening to me that could not. But I'm telling you that this is just an example. And so though you could afford the ribeye, which is your favorite, you go down and you see, hey, they have a, a petite sirloin that's $6 cheaper. And sirloin's not my favorite, but it's $6 cheaper. And so you order that. And over $6... You have proven to yourself that you, though you have worked and though you've come to a place in life where going out to, to dinner from time to time is something that you can do without hardship, you still are holding on to a spirit of poverty and a mentality of lack over six $1 bills. And for some of you, it's not even that. It's going to the grocery store. And buying bread that's one day old because it's one-tenth of the price of the fresh bread at the bakery. I could go down a long list, but many of you, as I am speaking, you're a child of God. But it's hard for you to believe that God would want to honor you and to bless you. But I'm here to tell you that God is a God of honor and God is a God of favor. Psalm 84, verse 11, no good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. I'm not saying that you should spend frivolously if you don't have the resources to do it. I'm not saying that if you don't have the money to go out and to buy something that'll put you in debt and put you in a financial burden and say, well, I'm a child of God now. I don't have to live by any budget. I don't have to live by any consequence for my crazy spending. No, that's not what I'm teaching. You always live within your means, and you always are a giver, according to the Scripture. The Bible says, excel in the gift of giving. 
But you have to be responsible for where you're at. But when you get to a place where you could make decisions that wouldn't hurt you financially and you still in the back of your mind can't do it, then you, my friend, need to ask God to deliver you from a spirit of poverty and lack. God wants to bless you and honor you. History tells us a true story that Napoleon one day was in a parade, and in that military parade, he was reviewing his troops. And as he was riding by on his royal steed, uh, something spooked his horse, and his horse reared up and almost threw Napoleon off of the horse. One of the buck privates that was being reviewed in the long line of the military just out of instinct, jumped out, grabbed the horse by the bridle, and settled it down. This young man had grown up around horses and knew how to settle the horse down. And and by grabbing the bridle and bringing the horse down and and, uh, helping Napoleon, Napoleon said, thank you very much, captain. He wasn't a captain. He was a buck private. But Napoleon shouted out for all to hear, Thank you, Captain. And the young buck private looked up at Napoleon and said, Captain, in total disbelief. And Napoleon said, Yes, you're now my captain. And he said, Captain of what? He said, Captain of my protective guard. And that day, Napoleon promoted that buck private to captain of his private guard. This didn't go over well with all of the captains who had worked their way up through the ranks the hard way. This young buck private that had just suddenly been promoted to Napoleon's private guard and the captain of that private guard, there was a lot of gossip behind his back and he was not popular. So the next time there was a military review, Napoleon had that buck private that he had made captain. Special uniform was made for this parade day. And Napoleon had him ride side by side with him throughout the parade and throughout the military review. When everybody saw that Napoleon loved this man and had promoted him and had him ride with him, then everybody wanted to have the favor of the buck private that had been promoted to the captain. Some of you were raised as a buck private your whole life and you have a buck private mindset. But the day that you laid your hand upon the cross of Jesus and admitted your sin and asked Christ to be Lord and Savior, God's promotion touched your life. And once you turn from sin and turn to Christ and begin to live according to the pleasures of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, God's pathway for you will always be a road of promotion. I want you to hear what I just said. The day you get saved, from that day forward, the trajectory of your life will constantly improve provided you are living by the covenant of God, living before the Lord, living holy, living just acknowledging him in prayer, reading his word, learning his word, living his word. Lastly, and I close with this, number seven, God wants to reward you with a long life. Look at Psalm uh, chapter 90. Back up one Psalm, Psalm 90. And verse 10, the Bible says, the days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength, they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow for it is soon cut off and we fly away. In Psalm 91, the Bible said, with long life, I will satisfy you. And so in Psalm 90, we have an idea as to what long life is. Long life in Psalm 90 was defined between 70 and 80 years old. That's considered a long life. If you've made it to 70, you've been blessed of the Lord. Many of you that are listening to me that are 70 years old or older probably could testify of times in your life that you could have died 
but God protected you in his mercy because God wants to protect and to increase the days of your life. As a child of God, listen very carefully, as a child of God, it should be a part of your prayer life. Father, I thank you that I will not die prematurely of sickness or disease, but you promised me with long life you would satisfy me. Almost every night when I'm home and Judy and I eat supper, when I pray, I usually include that in my prayer when I ask God to bless the food and thank Him for His faithfulness to put food on our table. I ask Him to make that food nourishing to our body. And I usually conclude that prayer by saying, and I thank you, Lord, that with long life, you will satisfy us. God wants to use your life. And if God wants to use your life, then time is valuable. And God wants to use you even in your old age. Psalm 1 said, you'll not wither even in your old age. A lot of people have been trained by the American culture to retire at 62. But at 62, you should be in the prime of life. You should be just beginning to learn the real wisdom of life and how things should be. I've preached for many pastors. I preached for one just a few weeks ago, 84 years old and still in health and still preaching in his pulpit under the anointing of the Holy Spirit every Sunday morning. Then the Bible tells us additional years can be added by honoring your parents. You say, my parents aren't worth honoring. That's not what the Bible said. Even if your parents were not good parents. And some of you had parents that were nightmares. Some of you suffered abuse at the hands of your parents. But that doesn't relieve you of the responsibility of honoring them. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1, 2, and 3. The Bible says, Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on the earth. So honoring our father and mother can add years to our life. Additional years can be added to your life by keeping your tongues from gossip and evil and lies. Many people die prematurely and sickness and disease invade their body simply because they don't control their tongue. They're bitter, they gossip, they spread untruth, they talk behind people's backs in a negative way. I don't like my pastor, my pastor did this. I don't like my brother, my brother did this. My sister... I, the Bible said you've got to keep your tongue from lies and evil and bitterness. Now go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 10. If you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Lying is a good way to die prematurely. Being a gossip is a good way to die prematurely. Being a negative talker is a good way not only to die prematurely, but the Bible said you won't even have happy days. I close with this. God hasn't promised us an eternal physical life. You can do everything according to the covenant of God. It doesn't mean you're going to live to be 316 years old. This physical body that you live in has an expiration date. God made it and created it as a physical body. It is a temporary housing for an eternal purpose. Your body is a temporary housing for an eternal purpose. 
The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave our earthly body, we will have a house in heaven and an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. This earthly tent, this physical body has an expiration date. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There is the hope and the promise of eternal life. Many of us have loved ones that are in heaven. I have loved ones that are in heaven. I buried my first grandson. He's in heaven. My father is in heaven. My grandmother, my grandfather... I could name a lot of loved ones that are in heaven. But because they knew Christ, because they had turned from sin and received salvation, because they lived in right relationship with God, they're in heaven and I have the hope of one day I'll meet them again. As I already showed you in the Psalms, in Psalm 90, the Bible spoke about a lifespan of 70 to 80 years, which it's unique that the Bible said that so many times thousands of years ago, and yet that is pretty much the average lifespan on most of the planet. Even 70 years is 25,550 days. That's right. If you live 70 years, you live 25,550 days. That's 3,650 weeks. That doesn't seem like a long time when you break it down into weeks. 3,650 weeks. That's 304 months. Think of how quickly a month goes by. But if you live a full life of 70 years, that's just 304 months. Let me give you the most important thing that you can learn today. You need to live every day ready to meet the Lord. Because even though He promised those who live under His covenant and in right relationship with Him, have the privilege of calling upon the name of the Lord when we face sickness or disease or trouble or snares or lack. He said, with long life, I'll satisfy you, but long life on this earth is nothing compared to eternity. Are you ready to meet the Lord today? Would you be ready for eternity? Some of you that might be listening to me have passed the 80 mark. And God has blessed you with long life. My mother is 89 years old. That's a long life. Would you like to be ready to meet the Lord? If you're listening to me right now and you don't have peace with God or you've never personally repented of sin and asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, Jesus said in John chapter 3, Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Wouldn't you like to be born again today? Wouldn't you like to have a brand new start with God today? Wouldn't you like to be God's son or God's daughter and know that these seven things, and by the way, this is not an exhaustive list. The Bible is full of many things that God wants to do for his children. The important thing is that you make peace with God and some of you need to do it right now. Just pray with me wherever you're at. Just pray with me. Say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. I want to know that God is my heavenly Father. I want to have peace with God. I'm willing to repent of sin. I humble my heart in your holy presence and I ask you to wash me and cleanse me from every sin, from every stain, and make me holy in your eyes. Today I turn from sin and I turn to Jesus. Come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. I vow this day I will serve the Lord. And I'll learn and love and live.